Okay, shalom everyone. This is Brother D. Um, I got a I got a truth seeker here uh, with me, a Christian truth seeker that's uh, reached out to me. Um, to, I feel like it's been a year, maybe more than that, um, to talk about the gospel and to talk about the Torah, the Law of Moses, and its relationship within the New Covenant. Um, and he he finally got in touch with me and is ready to talk, and so we're going to have a great talk tonight, and I'm so grateful for him, um, humbled by him. I don't know if he wants to say his first name at all. So far, I'm not going to mention his name. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, mention his name on social media at all. I'm not going to mention any ministry he's part of or anything. This is simply going to be for educational purposes. We're having a, a conversation and uh, we hope that, um, you know, if I'm wrong about something, he will show me um, or or give me some, some homework to do uh, and vice versa. You know, we're, we're, we're both truth seekers. I'll tell you that, and I, and I know it. I feel it. I'm talking with this guy before and have the way that he reached out to me. I know he's a truth seeker. And, um, you know, that's all we can really ask for is for us to have great dialogue so anyway i don't know if you want to say anything um if you want to say anything yeah i'll keep my uh my name anonymous but i mean okay. uh, like you like you said um you know just trying to seek for the truth and uh have also been looking forward to this dialogue for quite a while so so yeah uh, it's a privilege okay all right let me go back to the email real quick he sent me some questions ahead of time. Maybe we can start with that. We don't that. have to go strictly no? by that, but just those okay. Were yeah, just if we want to just chit chat, why don't why don't you just open up, man? Um, or if you want me to open up, whatever you want, whatever's comfortable for you. Okay, sure. Um, I can just give a little bit of context as to you know how I got to where I am right now. Um, okay. I was uh, raised in within like like mainstream, mainstream, like super mainstream evangelical Christianity, um, speaker sensitive, um, using verses out of context, but like enough Bible where you like, you know, the congregation wouldn't get super sketched out about, you know, what the pastor is saying. So like, just like super mainstream, like, you know, um, Christianity was my upbringing basically until I graduated high school. And so it was, it was kind of like a, like a mixture of everything um, from like charismaticism to like um, antinomianism to, you know, just, uh, just a lot of emotionalism too. So that was really the, the, up, the, the religious upbringing that I had. And so more morally sensitive, um, I guess you could say I had a Judeo Christian ethic in my, in my upbringing because of that context. But in terms of like seeking out for the truth and, and getting into the, the actual uh, word of God, like um, it was just non-existent. So um, in college was where my mind was really stretched um, because now that um, exterior uh, or external influence is no longer there. So it was just me and the word. And that forced me to yeah, really investigate more and more. And um, I believe that my conversion occurred sometime during my uh, freshman year in college, which was um, – a very big shift in which uh, it, I still attended like the same events. I still hung around generally with the same Christian crowd, but my reasoning for it was like totally different. Like it wasn't just for social reasons or so I can feel like, you know, I'm doing some good to the world and, and just kind of going with the cliches, but it was like I was legitimately now speaking out the truth. And that was really the, the pattern of uh, the rest of my college years was like just, like, no matter what the majority was saying, like, I just didn't take that for granted. I was speaking out the truth in the scripture. And once I graduated college, um, it was just like another pretty parallel to that because, you know, now you're, now I'm just as a working man, uh, as a young man, just like, you know, even more hungry to just, you know, make sure that what I believe in is for sure the truth. And it's not like culturally constructed or socially constructed. But it, you know, it's just, it, it is literally what uh, what God um, has meant uh, all this time. So um, that's why, yeah, just um, 
been uh, looking forward to this dialogue. Uh, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier. Like within the middle of my college years was when I ran into one of my uh, best friends currently, and he introduced me to some of what D um, uh, holds to at this moment, and uh, and that has been thought provoking at the very least. So um, yeah, that's yeah. That hopefully that gives just a a, a good enough context for uh, for this conversation from my end. Beautiful. Yeah, context is great. Um, you know my background, so I don't have to share. Most of my people listening yeah. mm-hmm. know my background. Uh, Christian, since the age of 16, brought up Pentecostal um, in the Latino, Spanish Pentecostal denomination. Uh, um, and uh, at the age of 18, left the church, had a debate with the pastor, and left the church after being punished for visiting other churches. <laughs> and then um, I went to a more contemporary kind of church. I went to a Christian Missionary Alliance church, which was my favorite experience out of all the churches I went to. That's where I met my wife. She was 14. I was 19. And uh, when she turned 18, that's when I decided to uh, court. It was courting. And uh, it was it was like a family, that church. Uh, unfortunately, mm-hmm. the doors closed down, closed down for financial reasons. Um the other church I went to was a black apostolic church that was horrendous, uh, money-hungry bishop, and had musicians that were professionally paid musicians that weren't even believers. It was horrendous. He would take off, he would take tithes and offerings like twice per service, um, wow. for, forcing people to speak in tongues. They would take them to a back room and like you know emotionally stir them up. And I'm guilty, guilty of being part of that. Um, but I began to expose them for their lack of holiness and being set apart from the world and basically I was asked to leave the church um uh went to a like a church of god kind of church that kind of branched off of a church of god is a Calvary Tabernacle and a nice church they had a house of prayer there that I um I got into um I really enjoyed the house of prayer movement uh that started in Kansas City Missouri in like the 90s and uh, being a musician, a singer myself, it, it really captured my mm-hmm. heart. So I found a mm-hmm. church that had a house of prayer, and I got involved with the house of prayer, but I didn't lo- let anyone know that I could sing or play music for an entire year because mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. I just want to, mm-hmm. I was going to college full-time, and I was just like, I just need to receive. I need to just be ministered to and just, you know, enjoy. After the year, people found out I could sing, and then right away they, you know, wanted me to do backup singing, and next thing you know, I started mm-hmm. leading a little bit. Um that church branched off, let the uh, the assistant pastor who was leading the House of Prayer movement start his own thing. And he did. There was a church around the corner that was about to close down for financial reasons, and they got together and turned it into the House of Prayer uh, in uh, New Jersey, the House of Prayer Eastern Gate. And I was uh, avid. Uh, people thought I was going to be in that ministry long term, full time. Mm-hmm. Um, but some things pulled me back. Again, I saw a lack of holiness, musicians that were worldly, um, a lack of evangelism. Um, I just saw it was religion uh, of you know yeah, just yeah, church yeah. in another f- with yeah. a different flavor. Uh, but yeah. you know, same conferences after conference, class after class, we just stayed to ourselves, and um, I I challenged that. And uh, long story short, I was sat down. Um, Mm. Even though I asked the pastor, have I committed any sin? Can you even tell me if there's one sin that I committed? He said, no. It's just that I'm not in full agreement with the ministry. And a ministry can't thrive and move forward if everyone's not in agreement. That's really what it came down to. And it was unfortunate. Uh, That hurt a lot. But... I decided back in 2000, that happened in 2000, summer of 2011, um, I, I was street preaching then and really into this like radical, like <laughs> radical Christianity, radical street preaching um, mm. and preaching against mainstream Christianity. And but when I left, I made a covenant. I grew out my hair. I said, I'm not going to cut my hair for a while. And my covenant is I'm never going to return to a 501c3 non-for-profit organizational church that's a basically a government institutionalized business uh if i am going to be in a church it's going to be a house church or if they have a building it better not be 501c3 (laughs) so that was a covenant i made and then i went back into my church history studies 
that I learned in college, which, by the way, I got a bachelor's degree in Christian counseling. I got an associate's in biblical studies from Pillar College or um, uh, Somerset Christian College, it was called at the time. Uh, in 2010, I got my bachelor's. So basically, I decided, I said, listen, something's wrong with Christianity. Something is wrong with the church. It doesn't match up with what I'm reading in the book of Acts. It doesn't match up. And I need to go back and see what's wrong, what changed. And as I went back into my studies, um, the Father rocked me. I went into a wilderness, basically. I didn't have fellowship. A lot of my comrades and friends that I've had, uh, you know, I was radical. I was bitter. I'll be honest. I didn't see it at the time. Obviously, I denied it. Uh, but I was very bitter, very angry. Uh, I felt like my entire career, uh, something was happening to my career. It was about to go away. <laughs> I went to college for nothing type of thing. And yeah, I yeah, spent yeah. my entire life in organized, relig organized Christianity. And I just felt this sense of it's all about to be gone. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Yep. So I, I started yeah, finding so out funny. some things. Yep, I went through the Ten Commandments. I started with that, and I started seeing how that was changed in the first century, second century, third century. Fourth, I mean, even in the first century, uh, the Epistle uh, Barnabas, um, you know, there's even writings in there that's anti-Torah, anti-Law of Moses. Anything that had to do with Jews, there's a lot of hatred uh, for it in the church writings of uh, Christian church fathers. And it bothered me. I said, this, this is wrong. And when I would look at Scripture, I couldn't see anything that supported their writings. Um, so it started with that. Uh, Ten Commandments started with the Sabbath. And from there on, everything just, I just started, window after window started to open up. A revelation of this, like the Scriptures actually started to make more sense to me. Uh, yeah, Genesis mm -hmm. to Revelation. I can actually match the New Testament with the Old Testament before it was like this foreign concept like I, I would read the book of Psalms and it's like I have to read it like a buffet I have to say yeah I can't I can't really relate to that and uh, I'll, this I can relate with and that I can't really relate with this I can't yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah. now I can read it and just really emotionally spiritually totally connect with it and and yeah. I can look at those people as my people those are my people that's where I, this is where I come from. These are, these are my forefathers. Before, that was like a, a weird concept. It's like, yeah, those are my forefathers, but, you know, it's only spiritual. And, you know, I'm, not, I'm a Gentile. So yeah, it was yeah, just yeah. It's hard. It was so hard. But now, anyway, so that's the background for me. And, um, yeah, I'm sitting on a conference call having a great conversation with this man. So... I think um, after hearing that, I'm probably just in an emotional, um, spiritual standpoint, probably somewhere where you were at around 2011. <laughs> wow. I wasn't expecting yeah. that. I can really relate to that part of what you just described. Right on. Yeah. I like a lot. There's a lot I like. You know, this I couldn't say this before in 2012 because 2012 is where I really renounced Christianity. But I was mm -hmm. bitter mm -hmm. that whole year. But mm -hmm. I learned a lot of good things from Christianity. Don't get me wrong. Not mm -hmm. everything Christianity preaches is false. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of great doctrine that are that's mm -hmm. solid. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but but what we're going to talk about tonight is not um, is not in any way, shape, or form. And uh, it is a different gospel, um, mm. you know. So, but yeah, um, there's a lot that I still took from it. That was great. Mm -hmm. So, um, sure. I guess I can share. And if you have questions, you can ask. Um, I can, let me, I still didn't pull up your questions just in case we don't answer at least can answer it, make sure it doesn't escape us throughout the okay. night. Okay, okay. Um, so to devote it to ya change. I'm so, my mind is so all over the place tonight. What am I doing? I want to change my login. I'm over here changing the 
profile picture. No, that's not what I want to do. Okay. Just had a really, really awesome call before this call, just for those of you who are hearing the recording. <laughs> um, let's see here. All right, I'm not going to get it on there. Let me get it on here. I don't even remember my password. That's how that's how much my mind is. Okay. I got it right here in front of me. Beautiful. So the brother sent me some questions. Um, here's the five questions. I'm going to just read it now um, just to get it out of the way. Not saying that I'm going to attack it right now. But how do you interpret Acts chapter 21 in relation to the distinction between Jews and Gentiles? Great question. Number two. What is your broad understanding of eschatology? That's a good question. Three, who do you appeal to in church history as your allies? Ebionites. Um, I just recently heard about them. Um, I don't know much about the Ebionites. I don't know much about okay. them. I heard about them, though, and people were asking me the same thing, like, you, you might relate with these people. And, um, number four, what is Paul in your eyes? Apostate? No. I don't believe Paul is apostate. Um, I believe he shares opinions, and um, I believe Paul is human, just like me and you, and he makes mistakes. Um, mm. And sometimes he has opinions that don't have anyone else to back him up with, and they're good, you know, they're good uh, suggestions. Uh, but I wouldn't take a lot of what he says as doctrine. Um, mm. Number five, what is the deal maker or deal breaker for someone's salvation? Is it the desire to obey the Torah as an Israelite? Because I understand you do not believe in works salvation, correct? Yes, that's correct. I do not believe in works-based salvation. Um, uh, alone is the key word. Uh, alone is the key word on both sides. I do not believe in faith alone salvation neither do i believe in works based salvation alone i believe first in faith and then works i believe that mm -hmm. faith without works is dead just like james says mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so you got to have both however faith is, pr is is a prerequisite faith is the first step outside mm -hmm. of works 100 percent outside of works mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so and that concept existed all throughout the old testament um, it's not a foreign concept. It's not a new concept mm -hmm. that came about just in the New Testament. Uh, but so let's let's do that. How about we um, how about we go through some scriptures? Uh, we sure. can go through through some scriptures from the Old Testament. Now we we both know uh, we don't we don't have to go through all of this. We both know what the Law of Moses is. We both know that mm -hmm. there's the Ten Commandments. There's the Book of the Law. Or, or the Book of the Covenant, which includes everything that Moses was given, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just to keep it simple. Uh, there's judgments, there's statutes, ordinances, there's commandments. Nonetheless, they're all instructions that were written in the book. And then you got the Ten mm -hmm. Commandments. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Okay. And let's see, where can we begin? Let's start at verse 1. Yep. Let's just start at verse 1. Okay. Now, I don't know if you have a study Bible in front of you or not, but if you do, it might, I wonder what it titles it, but this, this, uh, the one that I have in front of me says, The Results of Covenant Reaffirmation. Uh, so I don't know what you have. But uh, verse 1. It says, when you have experienced all these things, both the blessings and the curses, which, by the way, context, Yahuwah, the Father, gave Israel conditions. He said, if you obey these commandments, you're going to be blessed mm -hmm. in the promised land, blah, 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 blah. If you don't, these are all the curses that are going to come upon you. Mm -hmm. So that's all in mm -hmm. the book of tw uh, chapter 28 and so forth. He says, then, if you and your descendants turn to Yahuwah, your God, and obey him with your whole mind and being, just as I am commanding you today. So there's the love, there's just an example of love, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Verse 3, 
Yahuwah your God will reverse your captivity and have pity on you. He will turn and gather you from all the peoples among whom he has scattered you. Let me give you a little context. Part of Deuteronomy 28 and other passages, part of the consequences of not following Yahuwah's commandments, Yahuwah's uh, law, is to be scattered all over the world and not to be a people, uh, not to be a special kingdom, a special people called Israel, and not to have a promised land. So part of the consequences, if they don't obey, like a wife, if you're if you break if if you commit adultery against me, I'm gonna write you a bill of divorce and I'm kicking you out of my house. And that's mm-hmm. basically what the father's saying. The house is Israel, it's the promised land. But if they don't obey, people are gonna get scattered. Yeah. But it says if you and your descendants turn, so verse two it says if they repent, right? Your God uh, to your God, Yahuwah, and obey him with your whole mind and being, just as I command you today, Yahuwah, your God, will reverse your captivity and have pity on you. So he'll reverse the curse. He will turn and gather you from all the peoples among whom he has scattered you. So all the Gentile worlds. Verse 4, even if, you're, even if your exiles are in the most distant land, from there, Yahuwah, your God, will gather you and bring you back. I promise you, this has not happened yet. Would you agree? Absolutely. That's been my conviction ever since I read that verse. Yeah. The, the, the Father's chosen people have not been regathered and united into one land. We're all scattered all over the place. United. I'm sorry, but the President of the United States is not a Bible-believing person for, for what I know. He's not a righteous man. Um you know, I'm looking for the King of Kings to come and sit on a throne. Uh, so that none of that stuff has happened yet. Verse five. Then he will bring you to the land. See, it's physical. I don't believe this is. We can spiritualize this. I think this is a physical covenant, a physical promise that was given to Abraham, passed on to Isaac, passed on to Jacob. Then he will bring you into the land uh, your ancestors possessed, and you also will possess it. He will do better for you and multiply you more than he did your ancestors. So there's going to be, in the future, there's going to be better blessings, better multiplication. So that's not a surprise once we come to the New Testament that some things are better that came through the Messiah. And, and what's coming in the future yet, even yet still, is going to be better than what we have now. Because there's still yet a lot of promises and, and covenants that are yet to be fulfilled. Can you imagine mm-hmm. walking around and nobody's sick? No one. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a theology in Christianity, not everybody, but there's a kingdom now theology versus a kingdom mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. not yet theology, right? Mm-hmm. I hated that. I hated the kingdom now theology my whole Christian life. I was like, this is the dumbest thing. Who came <laughs> up with this thing? I mean, it makes no sense. I was always the kingdom now not yet guy. Like I understood that, you know, we have the the spirit in us and, you know, we can pray for people and can see healing. And I believe when when that does happen, it's not nothing about me. It's all about the father showing mercy and giving us a small mm-hmm. taste of that kingdom that's mm-hmm. coming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just a taste. It's just a sample. All right. Amen. We're on the same page. Um, oh, yeah. So he will do better for you and multiply you more than he did your ancestors. Verse 6, Then Yahuwah your God will also cleanse your heart and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your mind and being and so that you may live. The law of life, the law of the spirit of life that we hear about in the New Testament, it's all throughout here. Verse 7, And cleansing our hearts, the... the, (laughs) I love the book of Deuteronomy. At, I'll be honest. This is my personal, my personal uh, favorite book out of the first five books because I feel like there's more about the heart in this, in this whole entire mm-hmm. book. Mm-hmm. So I, I can relate this book a lot with the New Testament. Um, mm-hmm. Verse 7, it says, Then Yahuwah your God will put all these curses on your enemies. Hallelujah. On those who hate you and persecute you. You will return and obey Yahuwah, keeping all his commandments I am giving mm-hmm. you today. Now, in context to the writer of this book, which we, we suppose is Moses, 
the only context that they have for what the commandments are would be the commandments that he's given so far. Would you agree? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, and he's talking about the future, though. So mm-hmm. the future, he's saying is they're going to be keeping all his commandments. Um, verse 9, Then Yahuwah, your God, will make the labor of your hands abundantly successful and multiply your children, the offspring of your cattle, and the produce of your soil. For Yahuwah your God will once more rejoice over you to make you prosperous, just as he rejoiced over your ancestors. If you obey Yahuwah your God and keep his commandments and statutes that are written in this scroll of the law or this book of the law, but you must turn to him with your whole mind and being. That's what he wants. He doesn't care how you look on the outside. Well, he does care, but... What you, how you look on the outside doesn't compare to what he wants your heart and your mind to be, right? Amen. And what's important here is I would love to have my own farm. I would love to know what I'm eating, that I, I grew it myself, I raised it, and we live in a world where all of our stuff is controlled by a big, a big system, Mm-hmm. And they're doing all types of stuff to our food. They're changing the, the, the they're doing GMOs, genetic modifications, and which is against the which is against the Torah, by the way. You're not allowed to mix different species. You're not allowed to grow, uh, put different seeds, and um, uh, grow different types of plants uh, together. And that basically has to do with um, uh, what is it called? Uh, genetic, yes, yeah, genetic modification whether it be uh, mixing species of animals to try to come up with a new species or taking seeds out of our fruits and vegetables, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Okay, anyway, verse 11. This commandment I am giving you today, this is key right here. This commandment Mm -hmm. I am giving you today is not too difficult for you, nor is Mm -hmm. it too remote. In other words... What I'm asking you to do right now is not hard. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And what I've heard my whole Christian life is that the Old Testament is bondage. It's 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 a burden. It's a yoke. Um, But but and then and then the New Testament, Jesus's words is light. His yoke is his his yoke is light. His burden is, is easy. And so that's why every time I would read the Old Testament, I'm reading it with with this concept that the Old Testament's words are, this is too hard for me. But Mm -hmm. the Father Mm -hmm. said to his people, this is not difficult for you. And I think it would be Mm -hmm. really cruel of a Heavenly Father to give rules and regulations to a people that he he knows they cannot keep, that he knows are difficult, and then to lie to them and tell them, hey, listen, man, this is actually really easy. Like, I wouldn't do that to my son. I wouldn't mm-hmm. make rules and regulations in my house that I know my kid can't keep. And yeah. then, and not only that, punish him when he doesn't keep those commandments. Yeah. Actually mm-hmm. hold him accountable to it. That's mean. I think that's mm-hmm. really cruel. But I believe now, more than ever before, that the Father meant what he said, and it's actually true. Verse 12, it says, It is not in heaven, as though one must say, Who will go up to heaven? to get it for us and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. And it is not across the sea, as though one must say, who will cross over to the other side of the sea and get it for us and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. Mm -hmm. Very important, verse 14, for this this is very near you. This word that I'm giving you is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your mind. Or you can actually retranslate that as your heart. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It is in your heart so that you can do it. I'm going to show you something really cool. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Okay, I'm there. Let's go to... Let's start from from verse 1, just to be fair. But you're going to see how quickly this, this switches once you have context from Deuteronomy. Let's start at verse 1, Romans 10. It says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God on behalf of my fellow Israelites is for their salvation. For I can testify that they are zealous for God, 
but their zeal is not in line with the truth. For ignoring the righteousness that comes from God and seeking instead to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Messiah is the end of the law. This is where we get tripped up right here. Messiah mm -hmm. is the end of the law with the result that there is righteousness for everyone who believes. I'm going to explain this real quick, but then I'm going to move forward. The end, mm -hmm. that word end there, can mean is the goal. Or basically that the Messiah is the epitome. He is the epitome mm -hmm. of what righteousness really is. He is the perfect mm -hmm. example because yeah, he kept the, point, the Torah. Yeah, the focal point, yeah. Mm -hmm. He kept the commandments, right? He had to be a sinless sacrifice. He had to be perfect, right? Because if he wasn't, then mm -hmm. his blood wouldn't count for anything. But he obeyed all the commandments that were written in the law of Moses perfectly. And so he, with that being said, he is the only human being on the planet that has ever been able to do that. And he mm -hmm. is our prime example, both in heaven and not only that, he came down to the earth to show us how it's done. Mm -hmm. um, verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is by the law. Okay, he is making a distinction. I'm not going to lie there. He's making a distinction. But look at what he says. The one who does these things will live by them. End quote. And then he starts uh, verse 6. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. Where, he's, where, is, where is Paul getting this from? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. So even though verse 5 says Moses writes about righteousness that is by the law, and he says the one who does these things will live by them, it's, it almost sounds like he's, he's about to say something that's totally different, but mm -hmm. he's actually quoting from the same book of the law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Messiah down. Now you know the only difference between Deuteronomy and here is that Deuteronomy said word, that is to bring the word down, and here he's saying mm -hmm. Messiah. That's because Paul understands that John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word mm -hmm. was God. He's got mm -hmm. that down packed. Perfect. Verse 7, or who will descend into the abyss or into the sea? That is to bring the Messiah up from the, from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. Mm -hmm. So the word, the concept, the law of faith is right here in the book of Deuteronomy. It's the mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, he's appealing to Deuteronomy. To, yeah. Yep. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. That's basically what the Father's saying in Deuteronomy 30. You don't mm -hmm. got to go around searching extra far for it. Just confess mm -hmm. what, confess what I'm giving to you today, confess that you're going to follow me, that you're going to love me and believe my words, that I'm going to bless you if you obey me and hold on to that and you'll be good. Um, back to Deuteronomy. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Okay. Just a little bit more, because this is some more important parts that to connect with the New Testament. Um, verse 15. Look, I have set before you today life and prosperity on the one hand, and death and disaster on the other. So he's setting before them both life and blessings, right? Life and prosperity, mm -hmm. death and mm -hmm. a curse. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I am commanding you today is to love Yahuwah your God to walk in mm -hmm. his ways and to obey his commandments his statutes and his ordinances then you will live and become numerous and Yahuwah your God will bless you in the land which you are about to possess and mm -hmm. again we're still looking for that promised land we're still, we, we, we mm -hmm. still need mm -hmm. to get back to the promised land it's still a promise yet to, yet to be fulfilled mm -hmm. However, verse 17, however, if you turn aside and do not obey, but are lured away 
to worship and serve other gods, I declare to you this very day that you will certainly perish. You will not extend your time in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Mm-hmm. Now you can see this has a double, a double prophecy. Because mm-hmm. he's talking about that time, right? And that very soon near future, because they are going to mess up. But that's yeah. very, very relevant to the overall picture of being having eternal life versus eternal death. Mm-hmm. It's the same concept, and not and not inheriting uh, the kingdom. So, and then verse nineteen. This is important too. Today, I invoke heaven and earth as a witness against you, that I have set life and death, blessing and curse before you. Therefore, choose life, so that you and your descendants may live. So, heaven and earth were witnesses against us. Okay, but we're going to see later on, we'll go through some more scriptures when it says, you know, uh, that he nailed that which was against us, and it's going to make it seem like the law was against us, uh, mm-hmm. but th- that's, that's bad context. You've got to get full context, because if you're saying that everything that was against us got nailed to the cross, then you're saying heaven and earth is nailed to the cross, mm-hmm. and the same heaven and earth that the Messiah had in his time is still here. So with that being said, Let's move. Let's go a little bit more forward in the Old Testament to get some more context. You know the story. Israel rebels. Israel mm-hmm. worships other gods. They're stubborn. But there's always a remnant, right? There's always a small remnant that obeyed. It wasn't every Israelite. It was always a remnant of people who were faithful, especially the prophets. That's why they were raised up. But sometimes the majority of people ruin it for even the remnant and they get the consequences too let's go to jeremiah chapter three we're going to fast forward we we all me and you both know they did a horrible job keeping their part of the bargain their part of the covenant jeremiah chapter what uh chapter three i'm sorry okay. jeremiah three you know what let's do this just a little bit more context before we read Jeremiah. Deuteronomy 24. Yeah, this will be really important. Okay. Uh, this is about marriage and, and divorce. So just to get a little background on how Torah, how the law of Moses um, instructs about marriage and divorce and remarriage. Mm-hmm. Okay, Deuteronomy 24. Why don't you read, brother? Um Go ahead and read verse 1, and I think it's going to be the 4. 1 through 4? 1 through 4, yep. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife, and she has been defiled. But that is an abomination before Yahweh. You shall not bring sin on the land which Yahweh, your God, gives you as an inheritance. Very good. So, the issue here is not about the wife marrying another guy. The issue mm-hmm. is her getting divorced twice and trying mm-hmm. to come back to her first husband. Yeah, yeah. Right? You see that? Yeah. Verse 4. So that's what makes it an abomination. That's what makes yeah. it, it defiles the land, so forth and so on. It cannot be done, right? Yeah. So now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3 with the context that all throughout scripture, the father always calls Israel. He he relates to Israel. Um, one of the many metaphors that there are for Israel mm-hmm. is the bride. Mm-hmm. She, Israel, is the bride of the father, mm-hmm. which is Yah- Yahuwah or Yahweh, like you're saying. He is the bridegroom. Okay, he's the husband. And Jeremiah 3 is going to get real deep. <laughs> this is... A lot of adultery. She's been very unfaithful. She's not doing. She's mm-hmm. not loving her husband like mm-hmm. he wants, and she's not listening to his instructions, his commandments, 
and this is what's about to happen through the mouth of Jeremiah. Um, go ahead and read it. Jeremiah 3, verse 1. Just verse 1. God says, if a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he still return to her? Will not that land be completely polluted? But you are a harlot with many lovers, yet you turn to me, declares Yahweh. Keep going. Lift up your eyes to the bare height and see, where have you not been violated? By the roads you have sat for them like an Arab in the desert. And you polluted a land with your harlotry and with your wickedness. This is issues that were going on. Idolatry, Mm -hmm. uh, sorcery, Mm -hmm. um, uh, neglecting the widows and the poor, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, hating, hating your brother, a lot of coveting, a lot of jealousy, fighting over territory, fighting over land. Israel is fighting against each other. And they're mm-hmm. making covenants with the gods of other nations. Yep. And uh, so all this, being, and, and the Father's constantly punishing them, but forgiving them. Punishing them, but forgiving mm-hmm. them. Punishing them, kicking mm-hmm. them out the land, mm-hmm. bringing them back. Having people come in and destroy them, and bringing them back. But this is like the final, it's about to get real. Read verse yep. 3. Therefore the showers have been withheld, and there has been no spring rain. Yet you had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Keep going to verse um, 8. Go all the way to verse 8. Have you not just now called to me, my father? You are the friend of my youth. Will he be angry forever? forever? Will he be indignant to the end? Behold, you have spoken and have done evil things. You have had your way. Then Yahweh said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what faithless Israel did? He went up on every high hill, and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. I thought, after she has done all these things, she will return to me, but she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. And that was verse 8. So we see in verse 8, the bill of divorce, mm-hmm. the divorce papers, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's it. That's like, it's mm-hmm. over. Yep. Uh, that's not a, hey, I'm kicking you out, we're going to separate for a little while. That's, it's officially done. Yep. And uh, it's key to point out um, that he says this to the house of Israel, uh, which if you don't have a uh, context for this, basically the 12 tribes got into the promised land. They got their lands, mm-hmm. right? But yeah, yeah, over time, yeah. they split. Yep. They split up. There, there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, just like the United mm-hmm. States was for a while. And mm-hmm. the northern kingdom made up the 10 tribes of the north, and the southern kingdom made up of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin and some mm-hmm. Levites, because Levites were all over the place. Um yep. So the house of Israel, he's speaking to the house of Israel, really, uh, regarding the divorce, and he doesn't really say it to Judah, but he, but he says, Judah, you were, you're guilty, too. You're, you're, yep. you're bad as well. Yep. And yep. Uh, look at the history. The house of Israel had worse kings and worse priests than the house of Judah did. Yep. I mean, they were bad, but they weren't as bad as the northern kingdom. Yep. So, however... Despite that bad news, let's see if I can find it. I'll start reading here. Let me, t- let me take it from verse 9. It says, Because she took her prostitution so lightly, she defiled the land through her adulterous worship of gods made of wood and stone. In spite of all this, Israel's sister, Israel's sister unfaithful Judah, has not turned back to me with any sincerity. She has only pretended to do so, says Yahuwah. I'm reading from a net version, by the way, which... I think so far it's accurate. Mm-hmm. Verse, uh, verse 11. Then Yahuwah said to me, Under the circumstances, wayward Israel could have even be considered less guilty than unfaithful Judah. Verse 12. Go and shout this message to my people. This is the father talking to Jeremiah now. 
mm-hmm. personal mm-hmm. message to him. Go and shout this message to my people in the countries in the north. Okay, that's the northern kingdom. Tell them. And that's the northern kingdom which was scattered in the northern Gentile nations. You got the Babylonian mm-hmm. captivity and you have the Assyrian mm-hmm. captivity. So he says, tell them, come back to me, wayward Israel. Say, says Yahuwah, I will not continue to look on you with displeasure, for I am merciful, says Yahuwah. I will not be angry with you forever. So here becomes the question. Hold on. And it continues. It says, uh, verse 13, however, if you, if you must confess that you have done wrong and that you have rebelled against Yahuwah your God, you must confess mm-hmm. that you have given yourself to foreign gods under every green tree and have not obeyed my commands says Yahuwah. Come back to me, my wayward sons, says Yahuwah, for I am your true master. If you do, I will take one of you from each town and two of you from each family, and I will bring you back. He's talking about a remnant. It's always about a remnant. The road is narrow. A lot less people are going to be saved than what we think. Verse 15, I will give you leaders who will be faithful to me, they will lead you with knowledge and insight. It goes on and on and on. It basically talks about the restoration, right? He's like, I'm divorcing you, but come back. <laughs> and the question becomes, the mystery becomes, all right, Yahuwah, how are you going to do this? Because Jeremiah 3 started off quoting from Deuteronomy 24. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. standard is once a divorce is taken place, that's if yeah. that wife goes on to marry other lovers, she can't com- and she gets divorced, she can't come back to the first husband. Yeah. So how are you why are you calling them back? How are you what are you doing? I'm sure the angels are like, well, "What's going on? How are you what are you doing?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, Jeremiah 31. Let's jump to Jeremiah 31 real quick. I'm sure you you've probably seen this since you've been pondering on this and you probably seen I don't know, it's one of my favorite sections in Jeremiah. Oh, it kind of has to be because everything else is pretty bleak. Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-one. Want me to read it? Yeah, go ahead. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day. I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Although I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them and on their heart, and I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen. I mean, we can go on. There's nothing in this chapter that's going to mess up the context of what I'm saying. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it goes on. People will no longer, verse 34, people will no longer need a teacher their neighbors yeah. and relatives to know me for all of them yeah. from the least and to the most important will know me. That hasn't happened yet. Right. Yeah. I, agree. I mean, yep. if we need on. teachers, we would mean you wouldn't be having this conversation if we weren't seeking exactly. truth and if we had it fully in our hearts already. So, yeah. however, he's talking about a new covenant. So, yeah. and this is the only time in the old Testament where the word new covenant is shown and it tells us what the new covenant is, and this gets this gets quoted in the book of Hebrews, so it's very relevant to mm-hmm. what the right. Messiah yep. did, or both what the Messiah. I would say both what the Messiah did and what he's still yet to do. Um, and that's a concept that's not really preached much. It's almost like the new covenant, all of it is here right now, but that's yeah, impossible. Yeah, yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. Um, so let's go let's go to the New Testament now because I think we got what we need from the Old Testament. And I just, want just to, for you know clarification, yeah. like yes, you know, um, and this is kind of like you know you already know this, but just to kind of make it very explicit, you know, I think that if we're just if you and I were just to look at the Tanakh, the Old Testament as it is, we're like. We're buddy buddy, like we're identical. It's just when, like the real issues are pretty much like what whatever you're gonna bring to the forefront right now. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's really good. Uh, yeah. okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look in the book from book from the book of Matthew to John. I'm just gonna type in Israel. And there's some key 
key passages I want to go through. Matthew chapter 2, verse 6 is the first one that shows up. Let's read that. Matthew chapter 2. This is talking about the Messiah. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's go to verse 5. Mm-hmm. Matthew 2, 5. It says, In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, For it is written this way by the prophet. So now they're quoting the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. And it says, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are in no way least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler, or another word for that is a king, who will shepherd my people Israel. Mm-hmm. This is talking about the Messiah, right? And yep. on Christmas time, you know, uh, Christianity sings a song, you know, Noel, Noel, yep. born is the king of Israel. So the first thing I want to point out with, and something that was just, the, the, the veil was just on my eyes. I, I'm guilty of this, not knowing this as well. But uh-huh. if he's the king of Israel, and I'm his servant, I'm part of his yeah. kingdom, what does that make me? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Doesn't that make me an Israelite? Doesn't that make me a, 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 Isra- a citizen yeah. of Israel? Yeah. No, I see a logic there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's go to another one. And I'm just doing a word search. It's simply a word search mm-hmm. looking for the word Israel. Yeah. Um, let's see. Matthew chapter 10. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 that's one, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Verse 5 and 6. This is really, this is his mission now, okay? This is his, I would say this is his primary mission, his first mission. Mm-hmm. All mm-hmm. Right? I agree. So, yeah, yeah who um, should send Do not out? go into the way of the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather to the 12, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Boom. Boom. That's the house of Israel that's been divorced, oh. scattered. He wants to he wants to marry. <laughs> He's trying to get his wife back. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you. I need her to come back. Yeah, I yeah, like yeah. Her Very broken, particular, you know. You know? All right. Um let's see here. Fifteen Matthew fifteen twenty four is stronger than that one. Stronger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the side yep. makes it really clear. Yeah, I know this one too. Fifteen twenty four. Yeah, the woman. Yeah. Uh, and this is a Gentile woman. Look, the, this is a power. Yeah. I love this story. Verse twenty one. Yep. Canaanite woman. She's a Gentile. Okay. Have mercy on me. Lord, she says, son of David. This woman knows who he is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. My daughter is horribly demon-possessed, but he did not answer her a word. Then his disciples yeah. came and begged him, send that woman away, man. She keep on crying, man. She keep yeah. bothering us. And the Messiah answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's his number yeah, one thing mission. Is like, this is just like me interjecting like, it was always fascinating because it's like pretty deep into his ministry. It's saying like, like day one after John the Baptist, you know, he's like still saying this. True. Well into his ministry, you know. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. However, he didn't ignore her, right? Because mm-hmm. she had crazy faith. Her faith mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. unshakable. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, uh, so we know the rest of the story. I love it. I love that story. Mm-hmm. Even the yeah, dogs yeah. get the bread that fall from the master's table. Woo! My and then, yeah, her response terrible. to that. <laughs> I got a dog right behind me, my girl Daisy. And I tell you what, they're the most faithful animal in the world. Yeah. Um, so that's powerful. So with that being yeah. said, his primary mission was to restore Israel. And that makes sense because you cannot save people and bring people into a broken kingdom. If a kingdom is dis- like broken and divided against itself, what why do what are we going to preach to the Gentiles? What kingdom are we bringing them into? A messed up kingdom. Yeah, 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 yeah. So first, yeah. let me I fix the house. Maybe too, if like yeah, Jerusalem mm-hmm. didn't shred. Yeah. Let's fix the house up. Let's fix the house, yeah. and then we can invite people over and have dinners and all that. You know. Mm-hmm. 
Um, yep. Now let's go to, let's see, um, Matthew chapter 5, 17. verse 17. Yep. Go ahead and read it and tell me your thoughts. Tell me your thoughts about <laughs> verse 17. Tell me your thoughts about verse 18. And tell me your thoughts about verse 19. Read each one sure, one at a sure, time sure. and then just share your thoughts. Just throw it out there. No doubt. Um, so uh, evangelical Christians would call this the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's appropriate. Uh, That's fine. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. Um, basically, another way to kind of just refer to the Tanakh as a whole. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Um, so, my thoughts, well, a little bit of historical context, like, you know, this uh, this new rabbi, this new uh, teacher is, you know, basically challenging um, the status quo and, and, and at least how the status quo is teaching the law and the prophets. And so he's clarifying that I'm not trying to push push the Tanakh away or try to cancel it out, but I'm here to like actually fulfill it. Like all of its principles, all of its teachings are going to be lived out um and and taught correctly by myself. Those are my thoughts on seventeen. Verse eighteen. Uh, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And so until um, basically the cosmos like gets destroyed and, and something crazy happens um, the writing found in the Tanakh I would say that you know because it's the, the context is so uh, directly uh, or this verse is right after verse 17 that even though it just says the law in my version he's still referring to the Tanakh as a whole um, passed from the Tanakh uh, until all is accomplished yeah, so like you know very similar idea um, like every little jot and tittle is, is going to be uh, fulfilled and is going to find fulfillment in me. Verse 19, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so this emphasizing the fact that, uh, you know, emphasizing what he's been saying in the last two verses that the teachings found in the Torah as well as the Tanakh as a whole, they have to continue to be applied that my teaching is not some radical, um, you know, liberal teaching that, you know, came out of nowhere, but I'm actually going, my, my teaching traces back to the original document, unlike the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and what they were teaching. So, um, so yeah, just like uplifting the law, uplifting the Tanakh. Awesome. That's fantastic. Because most of the time, what Christianity would interpret verse 17 is the word fulfill means that he is going to uh, do the law for us so that we don't have to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's going to fulfill it in our place. No, I, would, no, I would disagree with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't see how you can get that from that. Yeah. And heaven and earth, again, hasn't passed away. Not the first heaven and earth, that is. Um it hasn't passed away yet. Things are still functioning the way it has since yeah, creation. Exactly. Um, so that's good, man. Fantastic. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Yeah, the seven woes. No, actually. It's, it is, for me... Oh, is, oh, yeah, the first section. Yeah, the first section before yep, the seven woes. This, this yeah. has been my staple lately. This is my thing mm -hmm. right now. I, I am. This is my motto. This is my anchor. This is my <laughs> home run. Yeah. And I just, I, like I, mean, I said, I, I just did a debate. I don't blame last you. Night. I don't blame you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really did a debate last you. night that lasted three hours or more, <laughs> and uh -huh. the guy was ignoring this passage. He would not. He we touched it one time, and the one time he touched it, he actually said can you read it can we do it together because i really don't see the connection that you're doing so that means he wasn't listening the whole time and after that after that time he still wasn't paying any attention or gave any credit to it. but let's do it it says then yahusha said to the crowds and to his disciples so he's talking to his disciples and non-disciples 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He says the experts in the law, or the scribes and the Pharisees, sit on the seat of Moses. Even the Message Bible says this passage awesome. <laughs> the Message Bible. <laughs> it, it, oh, I love the Message version of this. Um, but it says, uh, you know the history, right? You know this probably. Mo- the Moses seat is actually a physical seat that's in a library in Israel today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's like pictures of it, yeah. Yep. And it is known as the chair or a place of authority where, where the teacher sat that taught mm-hmm. the law of Moses. Yeah. Okay. What they did, and uh, yeah, kind of like a pulpit. Mm-hmm. Uh, or yeah, kind of. It's a special chair, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm not big on it. I don't see the seat of Moses anywhere in the Old Testament. I totally think mm-hmm. Yahua, Yahusha, yeah, yeah. the Messiah, is playing yeah. on some of the traditions of of the of the men at that time. Yeah, Second um, Temple Judaism. Mm-hmm. Um, but he understands that those who sit on the seat are supposed to be teaching from the book. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Verse 3, it says, Therefore, pay attention to what they tell you and do it. But do not do what they do. For they don't practice what they preach. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So do what they say, don't do what they do. And then it goes on and on, um, you know, talking about like uh, fringes and they put big fringes so people can see them and phylacteries mm-hmm. and tassels are yep. long just so people can yep. see them it's all pride they're taking yep. all these physical aspects physical commandments and it's yep. basically a show yep. um, and I'm sure you've seen that at this point you've seen a lot of that in Christianity yeah, no doubt. Um, I have and I, <laughs> I I was I was one of those guys that really hated it and actually tried my best to call it out for what it was. And I would get in trouble mm-hmm. for it. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, it goes on and on. Let's go to verse 20, 23. Go ahead and read 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law. I always found that phrase to be very fascinating. Yes. Uh, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done. And I know this is where you're focusing. You should have done without neglecting the others. That's correct. I, I like I like the way it said it. It's, it's correct. So in other words, those things are good, but mm-hmm. you should have also have done mm-hmm. The others. It's yep. not saying, yep. and this is what I heard last night from from this guy I debated, and this a lot of Christians. They say if you take care of the important things, the weightier matters, yep. then the lighter matters will get done for you. You don't have to do them; that's, they're automatically that's done for you. That's not what he said. And then, yep. if if that's true, why in the world do so many Christian churches tithe today? Yeah. You know, and it's not even the type of tithing that's actually biblical because this is talking about Mm -hmm. actual food. (laughs) So verse 24, blind guides, you strain out the gnat, yet swallow a camel. Uh, Woe to you experts in the law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Why would he call them hypocrites if he didn't want them to obey the law of Moses? Mm -hmm. Isn't hypocrite Mm -hmm. a word that you use for somebody who's not doing what they uh, practicing what they preach? Exactly. Yeah. And it falls right in line with verse 1, 2, and 3. You cannot understand this without reading verse 1, 2, and 3. And um, yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's any I'm more. With you. I'm with you. Yep. Yeah, I don't think there's any more we need to read on that. Um, and let's skip to the last chapter, Matthew 28. And then from here, we'll go, after this, we'll go to the epistles, unless you want to address anything in the gospel letters. Feel free. But okay. I feel like the book of Matthew is all we need. Um, to settle to settle this uh, this issue here, Matthew twenty eight, the Great Commission, my favorite, and uh, this is after the resurrection, which most mm-hmm. Christians will say the New Covenant started after the resurrection or at the death, w- whatever it doesn't matter whether the when the blood was shed, whether it's when he was sitting with his disciples and had the Last Supper, the New Covenant was in effect somewhere 
either the death, the resurrection, the outpouring of the Spirit, regardless. Most of the time you're going to find they say it was after the resurrection or at the death, the new covenant was in effect because it's covered by blood. Mm -hmm. So the Messiah is resurrected already. And he says in verse um, 18, Then Yahusha came up and said to them all, Authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. All mm -hmm. nations includes Jews, Israelites, and Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. That includes everybody, Chinese, uh, Puerto Rican, yep. Indian, everything. Yep. Immersing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the set-apart Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. That's past tense. Yeah. He's not saying teaching them to obey everything that I'm about to teach you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if, if we consider this to be past tense, everything that I have commanded you, it has mm -hmm. to include Matthew chapter 23. That was a commandment. He told them, therefore, pay attention to everything that they tell you to do and do it. That's a commandment. Even though he's not saying, hey, I'm commanding you, right? You don't need to have those words, right? It's already implied. If, he's give, if somebody's giving you instructions, it's an instruction. If somebody's telling you to do something, it's a, it's, it's, it's a command, especially if he's your teacher. So Matthew 28, I believe strongly that it includes Matthew chapter 23, verse 1 to 3, mm -hmm. and 23 mm -hmm. and on. Mm -hmm. uh, everything else we agree on, the, the Beatitudes, the blessed are you, and all that, and turn the other cheek, mm -hmm. and there's so many so many mm -hmm. things we can go into and nitpick and say, oh, this doesn't show up in the Old Testament, and that's that's fine. That does That's still not neglecting the fact that he said what he said in, verse, in chapter 23, verse 1 to 3. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, let's go. Do you have any questions, anything you want to bring up from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Uh, I guess, yeah, a little bit from the Matthew 20s, um, Matthew, um, like the last section of Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 33, the parable of the vineyard, um, the usual interpretation. And at the moment, um, this is also my interpretation is that this is kind of like showing how there's going to be some kind of transition of the kingdom from Israel to the Gentiles because of verse 41 uh, within the uh, the parable um, the vineyard will be given to other vine growers uh, who will pay in the proceeds at the proper times verse 43 the uh, kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people producing the fruit of it so I just kind of wanted your thoughts on that nice beautiful alright let's do it um, where can we start? Start at 33. Okay, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a fence around it, dug a pit for its wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenant farmers and went on a journey. When the harvest time was near, he sent his slaves or his servants to the tenants to collect his portion of the crop. But the tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will utterly destroy those evil men. Then he will lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his portion at the harvest. So that's the response. Yahushua, Yahushua Messiah asked the question, and that's the response that they gave. Yahushua mm -hmm. said to them, 
Have you never mm-hmm, read the mm-hmm, scriptures? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is a rebuke now. Have mm-hmm. you guys never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is from Yahuwah, and it is marvelous in your eyes. Where does that come from? Let's see. Psalms 118. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 8.14. Right? So forth and so on. Yep. Verse 43, for this reason I tell you that the kingdom of Elohim, the kingdom of God, will be taken from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. The one who falls, and I'll just say right now, that makes a whole lot of sense. We've always had a remnant, remember? I told you there was always a remnant. Uh And that's what it's about. It's not about being the physical people. It's about being a remnant. And I'll, I'll say this. this. This will go more to Gentiles because that's part of the promise, actually. That's part of the prophecy through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the fullness of the nations will mm-hmm. come in. And, and we didn't do this. We didn't build a little bit more foundation. But if we went to the book of, let's see here, Hosea, where mm-hmm. Hosea marries a prostitute, Mm-hmm. Okay, he marries a harlot woman who's an adulterer and has mm-hmm. children with her. And he names one of his children, if we go to the first chapter, um, mm-hmm. it's a very good scripture you brought up. And I didn't build a foundation for this. Let's see. Okay, verse 2. He says to Hosea, Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. Go marry a prostitute who will bear illegitimate children conceived through prostitution because the nation continually commits spiritual prostitution by turning away from Yahuwah. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim. Then she conceived and gave birth to a son for him. Then Yahuwah said to Hosea, Name him Jezreel because in a little while I will punish the dynasty of Jehu on account of the bloodshed in the valley of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. That's a prophecy. Mm -hmm. He's going to put an end to the kingdom of Israel. At that time, I will destroy military power of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. That's what happened with the destruction of the temple and the final uh, dispersion out of the land. Verse 6. And I'll go back to this a little bit more. Actually, we could dig deep, a little deeper into it. Let's look, go into a concordance. Verse 4. Look up that word Jezreel. And it's called God sows. He's sowing. Like you reap what you mm-hmm. sow. That's what it's, that's what it's called. Um, also, something important here. Let's see. I think that's all we need for now. So he's sowing. This is what he's using to sow. He's gonna he's gonna destroy Israel's gonna be destroyed. I think I think part of this also is the um the lost tribes of the house of Israel. That the the, the divorce that took place. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of this prophecy right here. And he's scattering them all over the world and it's almost like he's planting them as seeds. Mm-hmm. In Gentile nations, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just consider that thought, even if even if you mm-hmm. won't agree with it, just consider it. But if we keep reading Hosea chapter one verse five, it says, "At that time, I will destroy military power of Israel in the valley of Jezreel." Verse six, she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then Yahuwah said to him, "Name her No Pity or Lo Ruama, which means No Pity, because I will no longer have pity on the nation of Israel." For I will certainly not forgive her guilt. There it is. Have no pity on the nation of Israel. He's disowning Israel. Mm-hmm. But I will have pity on the nation of Judah. Mm-hmm. I will deliver them by Yahuwah, their God. I will not deliver them by the warriors, by, by the warrior's bow, by sword, by military victory, by chariots, horses, or by chariots. When she, when she had weaned Lo Ruama, which means no pity, she conceived again and gave birth to another son. 
Then Yahuwah said, Name him, not my people, Lo Ami, because you are not my people and I am not your God. Mm-hmm. Now, if you just stop there, you'll think, Up, oh, it's over. Israel is never going to be restored. And that's it, mm-hmm. it's over, it's gone. But if you read verse 10, it says, However, in the future, the number of the people of Israel will be like the sand of the sea. Why? Because I sowed them into the nations, mm-hmm. which can be neither measured nor numbered, although it was said to them, You are not my people. So even though I said that, it will be said to them, You are the children of the living God. Uh-huh. Then the people of Judah and the people of Israel will be gathered together. This is my favorite message right now. It's called the restoration of the two houses of Israel, which I believe is the gospel message. It's what we're longing and waiting to see be fulfilled. They will appoint for themselves one leader. Who's that? The Messiah, God himself, Yahuwah. I believe they're both one and the same. And will flourish in the land. Certainly the day of Jezreel will be great. And again, I was trying to look for the word Jezreel because from my previous knowledge, I thought Jezreel was just another name for Israel. But the concordance wasn't saying it. But I could have sworn I'd seen that before. That it was like a, a nickname for Israel. So it might be in a different dictionary. So, with that being said, he is going to disown them temporarily. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Matthew. Matthew 21, we were in 40, around 42, 43, around there. Okay. Uh, for 43, for this reason I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Doesn't that sound like Hosea chapter 1? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A little That's bit. Yeah. You know, yeah, like bit, he's going to take, he's going to, he's going to rip Israel apart. He's going to scatter Israel among the nations because he's going to call it God sows. So he's going to sow seed. Mm-hmm. That's why it's going to produce fruit. <laughs> given to a people who will produce its fruit. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and the one on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. Oh, he's not talking about the righteous Israelites. He's not talking about every Israelite. He's talking about the rebellious ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm, They wanted mm -hmm. to arrest him but they were afraid of the crowds because the crowds regarded him as a prophet. That's the problem right there. Cool? Is that pretty good? So just to clarify, verse 43, given to a people, you're saying that it's just those who, I guess for for clarity's sake, the remnant. Yes, I believe so. Those who are, you know, uh, properly worshiping Yahweh, Versus mm-hmm. those who are faking it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for question. I would definitely see it that way. Okay. That was a great question. That would probably be my main one. So yeah, I'm good. I'm good for now. Okay. Let's go to. Let's get a few from the Book of Acts. I gave you this in your in your email. I sent you this mm-hmm. as a question. So, Acts chapter 6, verse 13 to 15. And um, I don't know if you just wanted to go through this in detail because of the the listening audience, but, like... You're already familiar? Yeah, I'm pretty familiar. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you want to, like, fast forward it, it's really up to you. I'll paraphrase. But I am doing this for the audience. Um, Okay. Okay, Okay, gotcha. Acts Acts chapter 6, verse 13 to 15, basically, these these hypocrite Jews... Um, and Pharisees and scribes, they're accusing um, Stephen. Okay, they're accusing Stephen of mm-hmm, preaching mm-hmm. Um, a, a Messiah, a Yahusha, a name, this name of this man, Yahusha, who will destroy the temple and change the customs 
that Moses handed down. So that's basically what I want to point Very out. Good. The whole point I want to bring out is the author of the book of Acts is writing this, and he's on the good side. The author of the book of Acts is on our side. He's a good guy. Mm -hmm. And he understands that these were false accusations. That mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. it has to, you have to imply, it, it makes sense to imply that that was false and that the mm -hmm. Messiah mm -hmm. never mm -hmm. came to change the, the, the customs of the law of Moses and he did not come mm -hmm. to destroy the temple. When he said, I came to destroy, he said that one stone would not fall upon another. He was talking about his own body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But did he allow it? Did God allow it? Absolutely. That's part of the, you know, that's part of what the consequence, um, you know, but that's not what he said. The Messiah never said those words. So anyway, that was one false accusation. Um, the other one is, you know, we can go through Paul as well. They did the same thing with Paul. They falsely mm -hmm. accused Paul of, of being anti-law of Moses. And he's like, that's mm -hmm. completely not true. Um, he had to stand up in court and be like, yo, man, I, I grew up, you know, under yep. Gim Gim Gimliel, man. I'm, I, I, was, I was amongst the Pharisees, like, yep. and I love the Torah. Yep. And um, he even got advice from Peter to... Um, fulfill the vow for four guys to go with them as they shave their heads mm -hmm. just to show the Jews that, yo, all these rumors that you guys are spreading about me is not true. Look, let me give you, yeah. some, let me give you some evidence. Also, um, right after the book, uh, chapter 15, which is what we should touch on if you'd like, but right after, mm -hmm. chapter 15 talks about issues with the Gentiles, and this is what it all comes down to. Not proselytes. We're talking about ignorant Gentiles, Gentiles yeah, who have yeah, no yeah. idea yeah, about the Torah, okay? Because proselytes already know about the Torah, mm -hmm. okay, the customs and all that. But the problem is Jews are trying to force ignorant baby Gentiles and make it a prerequisite. Instead of a prere prerequisite to be saved being faith, they're making it circumcision and perfect obedience to the law of Moses, but really, circumcision is really the battle, majority. It's like the first step. Like, they've they got knives in their hands, and they're going around like, hey, man, you want to believe in the Messiah? We, we're Jews. We, we believe in him, and he, yeah, he's, he's a Jew. And if you want to be a Jew, you got to, you ready? Pull your pants down. Yeah. And that is what Paul was coming against. That's what, yeah. you know, all, that's really what he's aggressively against. So Acts chapter 15 is about that. It's about settling the matter that, listen, guys, Calm down. Um, let's let's pray about it. Let's talk about it. Let's hash this out yeah. real quick, um, yeah. because it is a valid thing to bring up. <laughs> because the Messiah did say, "I didn't come to destroy the law," and yeah. you know, I mean, we get it. But let's talk about this. These Gentiles, they don't know any better. They don't. They they're drenched in paganism. They worship yeah. idols. They're prostitutes. They're going to prostitute temples and eating food with blood in it and they're doing all types of wicked sorcery they got a lot of things they need to work on let's give them we prayed about it and we really felt by the spirit told us give them these these four things to start off with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the starting okay thing. yeah and and in chapter 15 i'm gonna say let's see if i can find it right after those things are given he says for for Moses is preached in the synagogues every Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It's a really key verse that gets ignored a lot. Let's see. I just want to point out for the, for the audience. 21, verse 21. Okay, right after they give the instructions in verse 19 and 20, they say, So this will be good for the Gentiles, for Moses has those that proclaim him in every town and ancient times because he is read aloud in the synagogues every Sabbath. One way they interpret that is, oh, let's give them these four things so that they don't get uh, contaminated by what they hear in the synagogues. You know, let's give them these four things so that they, they don't get confused. That's one way of interpreting it, which I think is completely wrong, versus let's give them these four things as they go to the synagogues and hear the law of Moses, which, by the way, is the only scriptures they had at that time to learn about righteousness and what is good and what is pure and what is unclean and what is clean. And that's the only manual they had. So he's saying, let's give them these four things for now. When they go to the synagogues each Sabbath, they'll have time to learn and hear, you know, little by little. 
And most people say circumcision, Christians say circumcision is of no value. You shouldn't get circumcised. It's, 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 it's accursed. If you, you know, if you believe in Messiah and you get circumcised, you're done. Then why in the very next chapter, right after this council, this, this whole meeting that they had, yeah, Paul circumcises Timothy, whose mother was a Jew, but his father was a Greek. Regardless of the reason, they can go into it. They they read down. They they say, oh, he did it because he was afraid of the Jews. You can assume that, but I would rather assume to be consistent with all the other accusations that are coming against Paul and Stephen and these guys. I would assume that he's doing it to show the Jews that he's those rumors are lies. What you guys yeah, are saying yeah, yeah, that I'm yeah. against circumcision and I don't, you know, I'm telling people not to get circumcised. That's not true, man. Yeah, yeah. But what I am saying is that they don't need to be circumcised up front to be considered our brothers. Yeah, yeah, it's not the prerequisite. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh-huh. And then, um, and then we go to Acts 10 or Acts, yeah, Acts 10 and 11. Just to paraphrase, unless you want to read specifically, is about Peter's vision. And this is a passage that gets taken out of context. This this is a license to eat pork and shrimp and everything that's unclean. They say Peter got a vision from God with all the unclean animals and God said to eat it. That's true. But f- w- first things first, that was a vision. <laughs> it wasn't a real situation. Mm-hmm. And then down uh, later on, Paul is thinking about this vision. He's contemplating about what this vision was all about. Like, what's the purpose? Father, why, why did you give me that vision? Like, why did I have that vision? And he meets these three guys, and they go to this the, the, a Gentile's house. Okay? Mm-hmm. A Gentile's house of a Gentile who actually heard God. He heard his voice mm-hmm. before he even got there. The Gentile was hearing his voice. And when he got into this house, there's a whole bunch of Gentiles, and then he goes, the light bulb goes on, he says, ah, now I know what that vision was about. I was taught by, my, by my, the traditions of my Jewish rabbis that we can't be in a house with Gentiles. We, we, can't, we can't even sit next to them because they're dogs, you know. But you're showing me. You're, you're, you're bringing me back to the, the law of Moses where it actually says in the book of Leviticus, there shall be one law for you, the native born, and the stranger that sojourns with you. You're reminding me of what the Torah says, that Gentiles are included. They can come in if they want to. They can mm-hmm. come and be part mm-hmm. of Israel. They can, they can be part of the mm-hmm. covenant. They can follow the same law we have. They can take mm-hmm. on our customs. Yeah. Because it was all corrupted. That whole concept was all corrupted. Even the temple, the third, uh, the, um, the third temple, right? The second temple. Temples, that temple that was existing at that time in, in the, uh, during the times of Messiah. That temple that was built had a totally different design than the original design. And they actually mm-hmm. separated yeah, yeah. Gentiles. They couldn't come but so, f- so close into the temple. That's, mm-hmm. not, that's not the way. It never was that way. There's no instruction. That was all man-made. So, so that's Acts chapter 10 and 11. That's what it's about. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, man, I think for me, that really just, just does it. But Colossians chapter 2 is a really good one. Colossians chapter 2. It's mm-hmm. very good to read this in context. This is all about... Um, the audience is obviously the congregation, the believers in Messiah, and there are people who are coming in to try to um, to try to rob the liberty of the believers with philosophy. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, philosophy is 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 is, is, Gre- is Greco-Roman uh, thought. You know, it's it's all wisdom from a very worldly perspective. It's, it's the lust, let's put it this way, it's the lust and the coveting of knowledge. Yep. Okay? It's being puffed up. So, it goes on and on and on. Verse 8 is where it talks about it. Be, be careful not to allow anyone to captive, captivate you through an empty, deceitful philosophy that is according to human traditions and the element, el- elemental spirits of the world, and not according to the Messiah. Does any of that sound like the law of Moses? Do you think the law of Moses is philosophy, 
human traditions, elemental spirits, or does that sound like something else? In context, or the pagan philosophy, and around there. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you too well. Oh, yeah, pagan philosophies. Pagan philosophies. Amen. Yeah. Correct yeah. answer. I mean, I don't... I, I'll be honest, as a Christian, I never read this that way. And to be, to be fair, I've never been approached with what I'm teaching you today as a Christian. Nobody ever came up to me. I never mm -hmm. even had debates with Seventh-day Adventists. That's how ignorant mm -hmm. I was about the subject. And I was, mm -hmm. I, was, I was an apologetics guy. I loved to debate people. Mm -hmm. you know? But who did I debate? I debated Calvinists, Arminians. I debated, debated Baptists. I debated uh, you know, liberal non-denominational people, Catholics, I, those are the type of people I debated. Mm. You know, atheists, I debated atheists, um, but I never touched, never touched Seventh-day Adventists, a Jew, I didn't even know, I remember, I remember when I wanted to, and I, I, I stopped. I, I, I started to try to like learn about it, like, how can I approach a Jew? And I remember I, I quit, like, really early. I was like, you know what? They're so stubborn. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to, I'm not uh -huh. even going to try. Yeah. I've seen those Jews down in Highland Park, New Jersey. I'm not, I'm not even going to try. I remember quitting. Yeah. Like, I didn't even spend a lot of time in studying it. Yeah. So, now, I can't say that if it was brought to my attention that I wouldn't have preached against it. I don't know. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But this for sure, when I read this, that never came to my mind. Law of Moses never came to my mind when I read this as a Christian. However, I don't remember reading uh, verse uh, 16 and 17. I don't remember reading this as a Christian. I don't ever remember that. It says, therefore, regarding everything that I just told you, all these pagans and philosophy and all these people that are trying to come and deceive you, don't let anyone judge you, or more, a better translation says, don't let any man judge you. It doesn't say don't let any brother judge you. It says don't let any man, so that's an outsider. Don't let anyone judge you with respect to food or drink or the matter of a feast, new moon, or Sabbath days, which these are not. I used to interpret this as pagans have their own Sabbaths and new moons and they have their own feasts. But well, it's not talking about that. It's definitely talking about, um, you'll see why. I believe it's talking about the Sabbaths and stuff of the Jews, which most Christians would interpret too because they say, you see, we don't have to follow the law of Moses because it's telling us right here in verse 16 and 17 not to, not, we don't have to follow that. But check this mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Consider how I'm, how I'm, about to, I'm about to break this down. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you in respect to food, drink, or matter, feast, or new moon, or Sabbath days. These are only the shadow of, of things to come. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read this in a different translation because this is where it starts to get funky with different translations. But the body of Messiah, that's really what it says. Versus the net would says, but the reality is Messiah. Mm -hmm. It's really body, and I'm going to tell you why. Let's read it like this. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you, comma, but the body of Messiah. Think about that for a second. Is that sound? Does that even sound correct and biblical? Does that match up? Do not let anyone judge you, but... Mm -hmm the body of Messiah or accept the body of Messiah. You can say no. Just think about it. Sorry, just, just, I just want some clarification. So you're saying that you're saying that Paul is saying that Christ is the judge, not whoever's talking all this stuff to you. You sound a little muffled. Is there something you can do to... Can you hear me right now? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll try to speak more clearly. So, you're saying that 
Paul is telling them to consider the judgment that comes from Christ rather than whatever's coming from the outside. Close. Very close. What I'm saying is judgment should come from those members of the body of Messiah, the brothers and sisters versus okay, okay, outsiders. Okay. okay. Okay, but yeah, okay, similar. Okay, I think I was on the right track, though. Okay. Yep, you were on the right track. You're very close. And and proof of that is uh, Matthew chapter... This lines up with, with Messiah's words. Matthew chapter 7. It says, Do not judge, verse 1, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For by the standard you judge, you will be judged. And the measure you use will be measured, will be the measure you receive. People like to stop there. Don't judge. Just don't judge. You're not allowed to judge. Yep. I've heard that. I've always hated that message in Christianity. That's one of the messages that always irked me in Christianity. Every church I went to, it was non judgmental, very weak, dis, uh, dis, uh, disabling, handicapping kind of a message of, you know, we shouldn't judge each other. And I'm just like, ah, why do they say that? <laughs> yeah. You know, you got to read. You got to continue reading. Verse 3, it says, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but fail to see the beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, while there is a big beam in your own you hypocrite. There's that word hypocrite again. First, remove the beam from your own eye. Then you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Yeah. So we should be moving specks from each other's eyes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I'll mm -hmm. give you, yeah, the father gave me an actual personal encounter to relate with this. I'm a roofer right now. I work on roofs. I put on shingles and do gutters and stuff for houses. Something fell in my eye, and I knew that it was different. It was something that I've never had in my eye before, and I was not going to get it out. I ran to my brother, Josiah. I ran to him like, bro, I know something's in my eye that I can't get it out. I opened my eye wide up. I was like, I don't care if we got dirty hands. Get it out. And he's like, all right, all right. He got in. He tried it with his hand. Couldn't get it with his hand. He got a pencil. You want to know what it was? A splinter. <laughs> a splinter, bro. He was like, bro, that wasn't just a piece of wood. It was a splinter, bro. Uh -huh. I was like, hallelujah, brother. I gave him a kiss. I said, thank you, my brother. That was Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> we just did Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a deeper revelation of that. I was like, oh, my goodness, bro. That's powerful. That's what it's about, you know. But anyways, just a little story there. So don't let any man judge you. Don't let outside people judge you. Don't let people who are not educated on the scriptures judge you. Don't let people who are, I yeah, you, yeah. Know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Only those who are, are mature, seasoned in the yeah. word that actually know. If you, don't, if you never read the law of Moses and you really don't have a good foundation, why are you telling me not to obey it? You really don't even know much about it. And yeah. honestly, that's most of the teachers and, and pastors and preachers in Christianity. Uh, they are un, uneducated on the law of yeah. Moses. Yeah. I've been to Christian college myself. You want to know how many Hebrew classes I took? Zero. You want to know how many Greek courses I took? Four. Uh-huh. Why? You want to know how much I learned about church history? A lot. You want to know how much I learned about uh, the forefathers of Israel and Judaism? Zero. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's a very, very poor yeah. foundation. Yeah. And, uh, and what do we get? A lot of philosophy. When you hear, I mean, if you hear that debate that I had last night, it's on my YouTube channel, you're going to hear this guy. He has commentary after commentary after commentary, philosophy, philosophy. He's, a, he's putting words in the scriptures that's not there. Mm -hmm. Oh, when, when the Messiah said the law, is, he's actually talking about the moral law, not the ceremonial law. Where, 
Where are you getting that? Yeah. I know yeah, yeah. from a commentary you're reading. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Anyways. Um Colossians two. John, first John is, is, is some good good things to go through. So with all that being said, with all that being said, we could start you're gonna start reading scripture a little bit differently. Um Chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Now by this we know that we come to know God. If we keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. The one who says, I have come to know God, and yet does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in such a person. But whoever obeys his word, and the Messiah said when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. He didn't say man does not live by bread alone, but by the moral laws or the moral commandments that proceed from... By the way, that doesn't... that that I just thought about it over like sleeping on it, that doesn't even make sense anyway because the word moral simply just means to do what is right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So when yeah. the Father gives a commandment, even if he gives you a commandment to wear fringes and you don't do it, it's wrong. It's just that simple. So yeah. everything is really moral. All the commandments yeah. are moral. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that whole terminology, I don't even understand who came up with it. Now, if you want to say lighter and weightier matters, like we read in chapter... Uh, Matthew agree, chapter yeah. 23, I'm perfectly fine with that because I see that in Scripture. Yeah. If you want to say some yeah. commandments are le mo more important than others, 100%. I high-five you. I agree. I agree. Matters of the heart, okay? Lusting, <laughs> coveting, pride, mm -hmm. jealousy, yeah. all those things. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%, hands down. I, I'm totally with you on it, okay? However, that's not saying that the other things get neglected. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So anyway, here, if you if you really believe in the Messiah, if you say you know God and you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. But whoever obeys his word, verse 5, 1 John 2, 5, but whoever obeys his word, truly, in this person, the love of God has been perfected. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, that's awesome. It's not just about believing. It's also obeying. Even if I want to obey the least of the commandments, like you read in Matthew chapter 5, Verse 19. Mm -hmm. So what? Yes, these little fringes, which probably isn't even the right fringes. This probably isn't even culturally the way that they did it in ancient times. Okay? Little shoelace things I got on my, around my pants. This is, this is, trust me, bro, this is not that big of a deal compared to having this on my heart. Yeah. These fringes are supposed to remind me to keep the commandments. When I look at it, it's like having a, a, a wedding ring. If I want to do something that I shouldn't be doing in my marriage, I look. I got that wedding ring on my hand. If I look at it, it should yep. be able to convict me. Yep. You know. But what's more important? Do I really need a wedding ring? No. You know what I mean? It should be on my yep. heart. I should want to uh, love my wife and be faithful to her. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So it's the same way, man. It's just powerful. Verse 6, the one who says he resides in God ought himself to walk just as Yahusha, the Messiah, walked. Oh, my goodness. Live like he did. Did he not keep the, the Sabbath day? Did he not keep the feast days? Did he eat pork and shrimp and cockroaches of the ocean? No. He didn't do those things. He obeyed those things. And we ought to walk as he walked. It doesn't say we should keep the moral, you know, only the moral parts that he did and everything else he fulfilled it for us so we don't have to. It's not what he said. And there's tons of more scriptures we can go over, by the way, that I know are very conflicting and very difficult in Paul's letters mainly. Because you won't get this from James. You won't get it from Peter. You're definitely not going to get it from First John. You're not going to get it from the book of Revelation. You're not going to get it from Jude. You're only going to find difficult issues with this topic because of Paul's letters, which his main mission 
his main ministry was about helping the Gentile, the ignorant Gentile believers. That's his main mission. He also helped the Jews too, okay? But his main goal was to protect the Gentiles. If you make the prerequisite circumcision and keeping the law of Moses, nobody's going to be able to be saved. Mm-hmm. You can't even you can't even do that with what what you what we believe Christianity thinks the commandments of Jesus are, which they think it's you know outside of what they call the ceremonial law. So all right, let's suppose let's suppose the Messiah did say you don't have to keep the Sabbath and all that stuff, but he he talked about all these heart matters. Even still, if you make that a prerequisite, like, hey, you have to obey every commandment that Jesus gave, that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> that is really hard. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we, you can't even do it either way. That concept never existed, that you're saved by works. Never. Not in the Old Testament. Nowhere. That's what man ended up preaching and teaching. You want to know what they did with dude? This is a little bit off topic. I'll say this real quick just so we can, I want to get to you and answer any questions you might have. But Deuteronomy chapter 24, the one that you read about marriage and divorce, mm-hmm. that's really one of the only passages about marriage and divorce. And it's so generic. It says that if, you, if, if for uncleanness you can divorce her. It doesn't really say like the Messiah said, except for adultery or fornication. It doesn't really say that. All it says is uncleanness. And you want to know how man has taken that in Judaism? This is how they've interpreted it in the Talmud. If you don't like the way your wife cooks, you can divorce her. If you actually have more passion for another woman, if you like another woman more than your wife, and you can divorce her and get that other woman. If you don't like the way she cleans, if you don't like something about her, you don't like the way... You know what I'm saying? And that's what the Messiah was combating. Yeah. That's why he brought up the whole divorce issue because y'all, y'all divorcing your wives is like, you're crazy. What are you guys doing? <laughs> you know, have you not learned from the father himself? Wasn't Israel whoring and cheating? How much patience did he have? Yeah. And you're divorcing your wives because they don't cook right? And then that woman who got caught in adultery, that woman who got caught in adultery and they wanted the Messiah to stone her, or they wanted oh, permission, they wanted license, they wanted to get him to sign on it. And you want to know what he said? Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. He was not saying stoning is no longer part of the law of Moses. That is not what he was teaching. What he was yeah. doing was upholding the law of Moses the right way it's supposed to be upheld. Because according to the law of Moses, both the man and the woman caught in adultery yeah, are to be yeah, stoned yeah, to yeah. death. Yeah. Why is the woman only here, guys? What's going on? What's really going on? Yeah, yeah. Straw man, yeah. There's probably one of y'all sick Pharisees and scribes that are probably in on this. And got away. And I believe that's exactly what he was doing. Because he, again, if he would have if he would have said stoning is no longer applicable, that's sin. Because he just took away and added to the scriptures, which is a violation of the law of Moses. And so he wouldn't have died a sinless, perfect sacrifice or a sinless, perfect person. Anyways, any scripture that you see about loving God and loving Messiah, keep his commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. It includes Matthew chapter 23, verse 1 to 3. It has to include that. And uh, it might not be a lot. And the reason why, and I'll leave you with this. The reason why it won't be it's not a lot is because the Jews were already keeping the Sabbath. There's no need to preach, hey, you guys got to keep the Sabbath. They're already doing it. His goal was to come and preach on things that they suck at. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you have a child who well, is obedient obvious. to if you have a child that's obedient to your rules and you have another child that's disobedient, why are you going to treat both of them the same? Are you going to get are you going to rebuke the child that's doing things right and tell them you know that you're supposed to be doing this this and this? You're like dad, I'm I'm doing all that. <laughs> tell Billy to do it. Yeah. You know? So that's why you don't see a lot of hey, keep the fees, keep the sabbath, wear fringes cuz they're doing all that physical stuff. It's easy. It's easy, bro. 
it is really not difficult to keep a Sabbath day. It's a weekly vacation, <laughs> for goodness sake. It's a weekly break. Uh, you really will see the blessing of it. Um, wearing fringes, not a big deal. It can get a little, little, little complicated, and, you know. Oh, I forgot the time on my thing or whatever. It's not a big deal, okay? But the feast days, they're celebrations, for goodness sake, for the most part, and and they're shadows of things to come. That's what I didn't point out about Colossians two. It doesn't say they are a shadow of things that already came. It says they are a shadow of things to come. That means there's still some things coming in the future that have yet to be fulfilled, which the feast days, the new moons, and the Sabbath days show us. Every time I keep the Sabbath with my wife, with my family, with my brothers and sisters, we, we get a taste of heaven. We get a taste of paradise. We're not working. We're not worried. We're not running errands. We're not stressed out versus Christianity today, they don't keep any day of rest. They call Sunday the Sabbath, but right after church, what, what do we go? We go shopping, we do grocery shopping, we do laundry, we go to the buffet, making people work, stressed yeah. out. <laughs> so anyway, I can go on and on, brother, but I, I want to definitely answer any questions you might have, even if it's from the email questions, um, anything you want, brother. Well, let me see here. Um, I guess it's like I'm looking at my paper right now, and mm-hmm. I got like two two things that I want to talk about. One is um, predestination and God's sovereignty. Um, I understand that you you're part of like reform circles in your Christian days. So like from this is just from my personal experience. So like this is not like authoritative at all, but just from my limited experience, it seems like Arminian that I met and Arminianism in general leads to just kind of this, um, this uh, lovey dovey kind of Christianity. Uh, that's uh, more about, um, you know, God loves you, and, mm-hmm. you know, it's like the thinking is that as long as there's uh, all this rhetoric about God loving you, then within the person's free will, they're going to be, like, overwhelmed by the fact that God loves them, that's so they're going to, like, become Christian or whatever. Whereas mm-hmm. in Calvinism, the emphasis is more on, like, the character of God. I think in your previous email, you know, you showed that you're aware of, like, Paul Washer and Ray Comfort. So that kind of yeah. preaching, like, you know, like yep. heavy emphasis on, like, God's a lot of the guys God's I looked up to, a lot of guys I looked up to, and helped and, me a lot to stay uh, on the right path. At this path. moment, you know, at this moment, you know, I still uh, respect that, and so I guess I just kind of wanted your thoughts on, like, yeah, like uh, first of all, like um, not necessarily Calvinism. I think that's a, an a unhelpful term because there's right. a lot of you know branches within it, and people sure. don't understand that term anyway. But like, just mm-hmm. yeah, predestination, like total depravity, or just mm-hmm. basically, like, is, is man able to, you know, have faith uh, and sustain his faith? You know what I mean? So I just want your thoughts mm-hmm. on that. Okay, great. Um, I do have scriptures for that, actually, because I just shared this with a brother who struggled with this as well this week. So I got, like, ten top scriptures for it. Um, Galatians 5, four, And this is actually going to touch on the Law of Moses issue, too. <laughs> All right. It says, if we go back a little bit, starting at verse 1. For freedom, Messiah has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Listen, Mm -hmm. Paul. Listen, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Messiah will be of no benefit to you at all. Again, hopefully after our whole discussion, this might make sense a little bit more sense, like you might be reading this slightly different than what you read it before. Again, remember in Acts chapter 16, he circumcised Timothy. If that's the truth, then Paul is a hypocrite, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So again, yeah. he's emphasizing, if you guys go to this false gospel that these stupid Juda- Judean circumcision parties preaching, you're done. Mm-hmm. Okay? 
If you get circumcised so that you can join them and go around and try to make more disciples by circumcising them first, you're done. Because yeah. you totally missed the message. You, you ain't got it, yeah. man. You're done. But anyway, verse 3. And I testify again to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be declared righteous by the law have now been alienated from Messiah. You who have fallen away from grace. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, I mean, this is a topic very important. You can fall away from grace. It is very possible. If it wasn't possible, Paul would not be warning the congregation about this. And he says right there, you who have fallen away. So there are some people who already fell away yeah. in his audience. That's a little, that's a little rough. That's, that's how those Reformed Baptists and Calvinists preach. They preach hard. Like Some of you in here are going to burn in hell. <laughs> yes, some of you even in here, you're going to die and not make it in the kingdom. That is, I don't, I don't hear that in contemporary churches and non-denominational churches. I only heard those things from Paul Washer and all these other guys. Yeah, 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 no doubt. That is yeah. the truth. That is hard. Okay, Hebrews chapter three verse four. I'm glad I, I'm glad I shared this with a brother because I really don't take notes, bro. I don't take notes. I mean, I, I scriptures are in my heart, but. I'm still learning a lot, and it's not like, hey, I got them like off the top of my head. So I'm glad I actually I was having this discussion this week, and I got these scriptures from my brother. So Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, it says, For every house is built by someone, built by the builder of all things. Nope, sorry, it's uh, later on. Let's see. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to things that was bespoken, but Messiah is faithful as a son in God's house. We are. It's in this chapter for sure. Mm. Oh, there it is. Verse 6. We are of his house if... If is the most strongest theological word in scripture. If, in fact, we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope. Let's go to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus 34. This is really powerful, this one. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Exodus 32. 32? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 32, starting at verse 31. Sure. Go ahead and read that one. Moses returned to Yahweh and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please, blot me out from your book, which you have written. One more verse. And Yahweh said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Wow. That, that should end the whole once saved, always saved um, mm -hmm. discussion right there. And, and without question, that is the book of life. That is definitely, that has to be the book of life. There is no other book. Um, similar, well, there is a book, there is a book of our works. Revelation also. Yeah, in the book of Revelation, there's the books of our works, I think it says, of what we've done. But basically, other than that, it's the book of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so this one's not talking about the book of works. This is definitely talking about, he's, he's destroying people. And again, if, if it was all about circumcision, the father would have never destroyed and killed Israelites who were circumcised. If, if salvation was about circumcision, mm -hmm. he would have sent the spirit of death and be like, oh, up, stop. Don't kill that guy. He's circumcised. Don't kill him. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they're covered. Good they're point. good. Nope. Good no, to him it didn't matter. I don't care if you're circumcised or not. You're wicked. Yeah. You're rebellious. You're stiff necked. You messed up. You worship that calf. I'm going to open up the earth and swallow you up. All right, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. 
The one who conquers will be dressed like them in white clothing, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will declare his name before my Father and before his angels. Mm -hmm. That's that book of life. The one who conquers, he makes it very clear. Now the Calvinists will say, yeah, they conquered because they were predestined to be conquered, and they always, they're part of the elect, and there's nothing they can do to not conquer. It was all part of the plan. Mm, no, I don't buy it. I never did. I actually used to debate. Um, I had some good brothers I street preached with, which, by the way, in 2012, they all left me, especially when I started coming against Christianity. I started denouncing the whole trinity, the, you know, the once saved, always saved. And they, I had a debate with seven Reformed Baptist Calvinist guys, seven against me in Taco Bell, Perth Amboy, New Jersey. My wife was there. It was intense. They were all ganging up on me. And they were guys who knew scripture. It's not like these guys are rookies. They yeah, yeah, they yeah. know their doctrine, okay? Yeah. And I'm, I was giving it to them. <laughs> but it was it was horrible because they were actually uh two of those two or two of those guys were my good friends and they really stabbed uh-huh. me in the back. They stabbed me hard. Um they exposed secret sins that I've transparently uh, told them throughout my walk, like things that I struggled with. And on social media, they threw it out in my face or they threw it out publicly. You know? And I'm like, yo, that was last year, bro. What's, like, why would you do that, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was really bad, bro. I had a really rough 2012, to say the least. And that's why I was so loud and aggressive and angry. It's true. It's true, man. But hallelujah. He healed me from all that, man. Yeah, I think that brings me to my um to my next question, which I I will be honest, um makes me a little nervous in, in your view on the Trinity. So could you just uh Yeah, yeah kind of I knew that was going to happen. Nervous. Sorry. Once yeah, I, I mean, said it, I was I'm like sure you anticipating Dang. asking that. You know? <laughs> Well, listen, let me tell you that you got nothing to worry about. I believe the Father and the Son are God. I believe, uh-huh. but further than that, here's the thing. Tr- by, by definition, the, word, the term Trinity means... Yeah, it doesn't, it's not in the Scripture, for sure. Exactly. It's not even in the Scripture. But the definition is three persons, one God, but the Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's like, hold up. You're saying they're all God, but they're not each other? How many people are there? Three persons? Is each one of them God? Yes. So how many gods are there? One. That doesn't make sense to me. And this is what I was bringing up to those Calvinists. I was like, let's try it again. How many people are there? In the Trinity. Three. Are each one of them God? Yes. How many gods are there? One. I'm like, yo, man. Okay, let me try it a different way, guys. Um, Romans 8, 9. Romans 8, 9. It says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, this person does not belong to him. How many spirits do we have inside of us as a believer? They will say, one. I was like, but it just said the spirit of Messiah and the spirit of God. It's like, yeah, it's, it's one. There's one spirit inside of us. I was like, okay, but the Messiah is not the spirit. Yes, that's true. And you know what I'm saying? Like, it gets really confusing. Uh-huh. Rather than where I went, and I'll be completely transparent here for the first time on YouTube and on this recording. I went away from Trinitarianism to uh, oneness, the oneness theology that's found in the Pentecostal, mainly the Pentecostal yeah, movement. Yeah, yeah. Okay? I thought that that is the most accurate explanation of the relationship between the Father and the Son. 
Okay? The Father is the Son. The distinctions are you have the Father who is God and He He dwells in unapproachable light. Oh. He is grand He is grand He is grand. He is wonderful. We can't behold his his beauty. We cannot handle it. We we will explode. He makes he he humbles himself and becomes a created being mm-hmm. called the image. He becomes an image of himself. Mm-hmm. And from there they create angels in heaven, creation and earth, heaven and earth, everything. And that's why you see let us make man in our image. I don't dis I don't disagree that there's multiple people there. Okay? That's the father and the son. But the thing is the father became a son. And it's through the son that he manifests himself to his creation. The father is the spirit. In the epistles it says the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there's liberty. You can interpret that two ways and it doesn't matter which one you do it to me. It can, the Lord can be Yahweh, like you say, or Yahuwah is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of Yahuwah is, there is liberty. Or you can say the Spirit of Messiah, I mean, um, the Messiah, right, is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of Messiah is, there is liberty. It doesn't matter way, which way you do it. The Father is Spirit. And when He sends his, his, uh, Himself to the world, of course, it's going to be in a way that is not the fullness of himself because we would die. <laughs> so however he decides to manifest in spirit, whether it's a burning bush, whether it's doves, whether it's a hand writing on a wall, whether it's the form of a man, which I believe is the Messiah, whenever you saw the angel or a man, and then next thing you know that man is being called the Lord, like it was in Abraham's day, that's the Messiah, and he's called the Lord. He's called Yahuwah. You know, and then it says in, in Proverbs chapter uh, 30, Proverbs chapter 32, I want to say, or chapter 30, verse 2. Yeah, chapter 30, verse 2, or verse 4. It says, who's ha- who has ascended into heaven and who has descended? Who has gathered up the winds in his fists? Who has bound up the waters in, in, a, in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? If you know it. So I don't have... I am totally in agreement. The father and the son are one. But just the oneness that I understand is a little bit deeper than the Trinity. I, I believe that the Trinity is actually a polytheistic definition of God. It's really three gods. It's not one God by definition. They're saying it's one God, but it's really three because they're saying the Son is not the Father. From eternity past to eternity future. They never are, they never were, they never are, they're not, and they never will be. They never were, they're not, and they never will be. That to me is three gods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus one God. Uh, one being dwelling in unapproachable light. Um, so, anyway... So I didn't mean to scare you with, I don't believe in Trinity, and I understand, but you got nothing to worry about, man. I, I believe. There's no other way. Um, he's the husband of Israel. And it won't make sense to me that he sends his son to take on his bride. I, I just, that concept is way, just doesn't work for me. In the Old Testament, he rebuked Israel for asking for an earthly king. He's like, but I'll give you one anyway in the book of 1 Samuel. I'm going to give you a king anyway. I'm supposed to be your king, though. So he told Samuel, Samuel, don't worry about it. They're rejecting me as king. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So why is he going to send a a totally different person in his place to take the place that he always wanted? The whole Old Testament talks about the grand day of, of the Lord, the great day of Yahuwah. And Joe chapter 2 says, all who call upon the name of Yahuwah, it doesn't say all who call upon the name of Jesus. So when you come to the New Testament, and that's why I call his name Yahusha, I don't call him Jesus because Jesus does not have any meaning to it at all. 
Mm-hmm. Yahusha is that. his name, or Yahushua, or Yahshua at least. Try something. But Yah, Yah is the short version of the Father's name. That's why we say Hallelujah. Hallelujah is a Hebrew phrase that means praise Yah, or praise Yahweh, praise Yahuwah. Same difference. So, Joe 2 says, all who call upon the name of Yahuwah shall be delivered. Guess what? We got a guy who's born on the earth and his name is Yah Saves. Yahusha. Yah Saves. <laughs> you want to know the letters of the Father in pictographic ancient Hebrew? Pictures from, from right to left. A picture of a hand. The next letter is a picture of a, a man beholding with his hands up so it's behold hand behold the next letter is a nail hand behold nail last word is behold y-h-w-h hand behold nail behold if you read it backwards it's behold hand behold nail that's the father's name it was always part of his plan to die for his creation he is the savior he is the shepherd he's always been the shepherd he's always been the king He's going to be the best earthly king, and he's going to be the best heavenly king. And in the last book of Revelation, you have both the Lamb and God sitting on one throne. It doesn't say two thrones. It doesn't say the, the thrones of God and the Lamb. So we're not going to be sitting there with two separate thrones. No, we're going to be beholding one person sitting on a throne. And we're going to really see, finally, who the Father really is and the Son, and the Spirit. The Spirit doesn't get left out. They're all one and the same. Anyway, so that's where I stand on that, brother. Okay, all right. And, um, sorry, one more. Um, yeah. And then I'm pretty much done. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I don't expect, like, you know, like a totally authoritative answer because, uh, you know, you don't have... Uh, the perspective of God and you see into man's heart and can determine, you know, who, uh, who's in and who's out. But um, I understand their position is anything within the realm of Christianity is false. Um, so I guess just playing devil's advocate, my question is, while generally uh, that is true from your viewpoint, do you think that there are people within Christianity, like individuals, um, who are kind of like those Acts 15, like ignorant Gentiles, like, they, like they're like they legitimately committed to the Messiah, but due to lack of education, due to lack of um, exposure to more proper teaching of the Tanakh, they are where they're at. But they're like legit, they're legit, like they're committed, and if they were hypothetically to die, they would be with uh, be with the Lord. One hundred and ten percent. Yes. Okay. Mm. Without question, salvation is by faith. And mm. I remember when I was sixteen. And although I, I'm not gonna lie, I've questioned my salvation. I've questioned many times. Um, was I really saved, Father, that whole time? And here's what He reminded me of. There might have been times where I definitely was lost my salvation, and if I would have died, I would have been in the lake of fire. There's plenty of times. I sinned, I fell, and I was in, addicted to pornography and dealing with stuff and leading worship all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Very bad place. Mm-hmm. However, despite that, my repentance, just like David, I had a strong comeback every time. I didn't last a long time staying in my mud. I had a very, very strong uh, life of repenting, you know, yeah. opening up, being transparent, telling brothers, hey, man, I need accountability, bro. Like, I need you to lock up my phone. I need you to, let's get covenant eyes on my computer. I was that kind of guy. Uh-huh. And then it got shoved in my face years later when that relationship went sour, but it's all good. I'm still here. And guess what? My wife locks up my phone. My wife knows uh, we have a, a, a program called K9 Web Protection right now on my computer. She, she's the only one that has a password. She can see the history and anything that's questionable. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, that's who I am. I know, where I'm, I know where I'm weak. I know where I need to be protecting myself. 
Yeah. So when I, when I committed myself to the man who I know today as Yahusha, I didn't, just com I didn't commit to a religion. That wasn't even in my mind. That's yeah, why yeah. I left the Pentecostal church two years later because it wasn't what I committed to. I committed yeah, to the yeah, Bible. I, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. I committed to the Bible. And once I started seeing that the church was doing things that wasn't in the Bible, I was like, hold up. Mm -hmm. I got a question. I have a problem. And that's why I bounced around so much because I always, I found myself coming into problems with leadership. And, and they would say, oh, that's because I'm rebellious. I don't know how to submit to authority. No. Mm -hmm. That's never been the issue with me, man. Sincerely, I tell you the truth. I was I was the puppet. I was the right hand man of many many pastors. If I would have shut my mouth, everything would have been good with me. I could have yeah. been I could have been a full time minister right now. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But I gave it all up. I risked it yeah. because I asked questions and I had I had I, I, <laughs> I see a problem. I see I see something that's not lining up with scripture. And uh, so anyway, I know when I committed myself, I didn't know everything, not even close. And the more I read, the more I know I, how much I don't know. And so I, I would say, for the most part, I was genuinely saved. I was genuinely walking in truth. And because I didn't stop my pursuit, although I slowed down many times, and like I said, if I would have died, I would have been done, but his mercy kept me alive and I was able to speak this truth or able to see this truth. You know, he opened my eyes because I was a seeker. Whenever, you know, people came to me with things I didn't know and I didn't have the answer for it, you best believe I'm staying up till five in the morning till the sun starts coming up to find that answer. I am a researcher. I will dig and dig. Maybe it's the competitive spirit in me. You know, I, did, I was an athlete and everything like that, but I think the Father created me that way. I was just hungry. Like, if I didn't have the answer for something, I'm going to find the answer. Uh -huh. And um, so with that being said, if, that, if, if that's the case for me, I have no doubts that there are tons of brothers. and There are tons of lost sheep. Let's put it that way. There are many, many, many lost sheep in the Christian churches. But the teachers, for the most part, mm -hmm. not for the most part, I would say a higher percentage of the teachers are 100% not saved versus a small percentage of the members are saved. Okay. I just met with a Christian pastor uh, uh, three weeks ago extremely humble guy man had a great time with him in Panera Bread great conversation totally open minded um, and he wants to have a round two you know um, that he seemed very to me he seems genuine he took on that position as a pastor because he cares about people he loves people he wanted to hear my story he, he appreciated me sharing my brokenness and my bitterness and my hurt he was like, I'm glad you shared that today because if you didn't and you just shared your theology, I would not have been engaged. Like I would, I would have a wall up. I was like, I, I, I was like, I knew that when I met you and I and I we talked, bro. Let's put it this way: I was outside of his church in the cold in the winter recently um, with signs. With signs, the law of Moses has not been done away with. Read Matthew chapter 23. Salvation is for Israel, not for Christianity. The new covenant, you know, is the law being put in your hearts. It's like, I have signs up like that, right? And mm -hmm. I'm preaching outside the church, talk, trying to talk to people. He came outside during service. He came outside without a jacket on, spent about 10 minutes talking with me in the cold while he's shaking, but in a respectful way. He's like, I really want to understand, like, what you believe, like, mm -hmm. you know, and I was like, all I want, I was like, listen, I've been, I've been trying to do this for four years. It's like pulling teeth to try to talk with pastors about this message. Mm -hmm. I have to actually be a little deceptive. I have to call pastors and say, hey, man, I'd like to talk to you about the gospel. You know, there's a lot of gospels being preached out there. I just want to check and see what kind of gospel you guys are preaching. Okay, sure, let's sit down. 
And as soon as I sit down with them and bring up the law of Moses, oh, man, you set me up. It's like, no, I didn't set you up, man. I really want to talk about this. And then they get defensive and they think, you know, I'm falling from grace and it becomes a debate. And, and I'm like, so I'm trying a different way of doing it. I'm sitting outside of churches now with signs and I'm being respectful. I'm trying to talk with people and engage with people. Um, and he came outside. He respected that. He's like, I'd like to sit down with you and give you that opportunity. And just the way he talked, bro, I could tell he was different. Mm-hmm. And so... Again, I think he would be an exception, a guy like him. Okay. So anyway, I hope that answers your question, man. Yeah, no, it does. It was very helpful. Um, do you have any questions for me? Um, no, um, not right now. I think I gave you a lot of stuff today, and I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to force you or try to rush you in anything, man. Just, just take yeah, what yeah. you heard today, chew on it, pray about it. If you can take a day to fast, man, that would be fantastic. Um, and 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 come, let's follow up, man. Let's follow up because I bet there's not there's not anybody you know that knows this message. And uh, if I'm the only guy, call me back. Let's follow up. And if you find something that's conflicting that you think goes against what I shared, please share, show me. I'm 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 honest when I say I'm willing to be proved wrong. I'm waiting for somebody to show me if I'm wrong or not. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean I've yeah, been debating you. several people now. I've debated several people now, and uh, I become more and more convinced every time I debate someone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, so, anyways, I wish you the best, man. And and uh, yeah. Thank you, again, man. I, I think we had a great I think we had a great time tonight and. I can feel you're a seeker, and that's why I said I'm here with a truth seeker because that you're where I was. You're you're like me, um, and uh, just stay hungry, man. Stay hungry, stay humble. Yeah, no Don't be satisfied with quick, easy answers, um, unless it's really that obviously, and it comes from scripture. Don't yeah. you know? Don't be set. And I, I I know you're not. That's why you're. That's why we're you're where you're at. Anyways, let me stop the recording, brother. Um, so for everybody right. listening, I hope that you enjoyed this uh, conversation. You can see that it can be done. You can have respectful conversations with people. You might not have to agree on everything, but it can be done, okay? We don't have to yell at everyone. Everybody doesn't need to be rebuked harshly, okay? There are some people who are true seekers, and we all need to be mature and respectful and listen to each other. All right, so I hope you guys enjoy this. Shalom.